Hello, my name is Ruben Leon. I work for the Division of Services for the Deaf and the Hard of Hearing in Greensboro. I work there as a deaf specialist. As you all may know, next month in February is Black History Month. And for that reason, we decided to invite Dr. Joseph Hill here with us today. We invited Joseph because he is a professor at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And he has also written a few books, and one of these books talks about black ASL. So um, I will let Dr. Hill explain a little bit more about black, uh, black ASL, but before he does that, I'd like for him to explain more about himself. Okay, thanks. So well, like you said, I, I got a... I am a professor, an assistant professor. I got my PhD in linguistics, which is basically the study of languages and their structure, uh, looking at why a person signs a certain way or why another person speaks a certain way. So that's basically what I do is I work in linguistics. I also uh, teach um, ASL methods at the university, and I uh, meet with students, and uh, that's basically what I do at the university. Thank you. What made you decide to study and write a book on black ASL? Well, really, I was fortunate. When I was at Gallaudet University, there were two uh, professors there. Uh, one uh, named uh, Seal Lucas, a uh, very well-known uh, professor in the field of linguistics and ASL. The other was uh, Carolyn McCaskill, and she was a black deaf professor at the university in, in the ASL studies department there. Uh, they invited me to uh, participate in this study, and once I began working in this area, I started learning about, wow, there's some differences in, in black ASL, and I wanted to learn more about that. So really, that's how it all began, and I really got totally immersed into this whole field. I didn't study black ASL all over the United States. I focused mainly on areas in the South and in areas where uh, schools for the deaf were segregated in the 60s and beforehand. Uh, because of the segregation of the schools, uh, black deaf students and white deaf students didn't have much interaction, so there were different signs at the different schools. So I did the research and studies to find out what type of signs they used in their schools. And that's what I was learning about. Thank you. And as you mentioned, you did your study primarily in the South. Do they all sign the same? Oh, no, no, no. Um, during my research, I went to several different states, um, all the southern states, of course, and then also went to uh, some states, for example, like Texas, which is near Mexico. So a total of about 17 states I, I went to and visited, and every state had a residential school for the deaf or black students. That was uh, one similarity. Now, each state also had their own signs. For example, let me uh, think of one here. For example, here in North Carolina, I'll give you an example from North Carolina. The sign for bathroom in North Carolina was the middle finger touching your chest. In Virginia, it was your thumb at your cheek. Uh, in Texas, the sign was a sign where you rubbed your thumb against the sign of your chest. So there were very different ways that people signed certain signs in the different states. Um, it wasn't extremely different. It, it's something you would normally see happen in a small community where people would develop their own signs. But then once they graduated and socialized with the mainstream community, the signs became pretty much standardized. Okay. Um, what is your, what are you hoping? What was your main hope in writing this book? Well, my hope was that you no know, more people would learn about black ASL. Uh, it's, it's something that some people are aware of, but not many are. Uh, after publishing the book, uh, a lot of people were fascinated. I was asked to present often, and uh, it was really eye-opening to a lot of people. Actually, a lot of the older black deaf community members still use these signs. Uh, they learned them when they were in schools, and then interpreters uh, interpret for them, and they don't understand the signs. And uh, this book has kind of helped them to understand what the signs are. Uh, so that's one thing I've hoped to get out of this. Also, it's a way to record these signs, a way to document this and keep it. So uh, when these signs are not used any longer, at least we have record of them. It's a way of preserving this sign language and help interpreters know that the variety of signs that are used by people in the deaf community, especially the black deaf community. And it's not only older black deaf community members I'm looking at, but also young black deaf members who, now that the segregated schools are now mainstreamed, uh, you have uh, 
white and deaf, black deaf students in the same schools, and they actually have some different signs too. You mentioned young black deaf students. Do you have examples of signs that they use today? Well, I can give you an example like in the, in the African-American community with uh, hearing members. Uh, they tend to use their own terminology and jargon and saying things. Let me think of an example. Like you may hear someone say, stop tripping. For example, stop tripping does not mean stop tripping over your feet or something. It means, you know, stop freaking out. You know, don't overreact. You know, cut that out. You're acting, you're overreacting. You're being silly. Another phrase may be that, you know, I know that's right. I know that's right. And it pretty much means that I'm in agreement with you. That's what that for term means. It doesn't mean that I literally know that is right. It's a term of agreement. And it's also shown in different ways because they use facial expressions and body language to communicate too. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sure that after this video, people will come to you and ask you more about your study. So thank you so much. Sure. You're welcome.